We want to talk this week as Palm Sunday, amen? Oh, this season is, I am so pumped up. I am so pumped up. This is my favorite season of the whole entire year is Easter and resurrection. Resurrection. I don't even like to use the word Easter. It is Resurrection Sunday where even death couldn't keep Jesus down. Even death. Woo! Oh, man, oh, man. So we want to start talking about uh, uh, a little bit about this um, and maybe get a new perspective from this. This is the season, this Passover season, that the children of Israel were in their bondage. I mean, when I say bonds, there were some that were in chains. There were some that were going to spend their whole entire... Do you know that the average lifespan for a man was 43 years old? 43 years old. I'd have been dead for 15 years on average. 15 years! And uh, that, that's just the way it is. There was. They were literally worked to death. You know, they literally worked them to death. So we have all these... Uh, evil's working against them, and God, with his mighty hand, with his mighty hand, he took his son, that's what he called Israel, he said, Israel, my son, out of the hands of the devil, so to speak. This, this is all. God gave us the physical to teach us of something spiritual. We always have to remember that when we're studying scripture. He gave us the physical to teach us about the spiritual. So Egypt had them in bonds, and he called them out. God's going to take his sons, his daughters, and take them right out of the hands of the devil. Amen? He's going he's to get the victory. So every day, so on, on the night, all these plagues came against all the, uh, the people of Egypt. They had all their gods that they worshipped. They had a lot of them. So all these plagues that came along, these ten plagues, you could actually say there was eleven of them. But there was 10 of them. The last one was when the river, uh, when, the, when the Red Sea opened up and swallowed them all up. So that was actually the 11. But the 10 that came, every one of them was against a God that they served. Every one of them. When the sun was darkened, when the Nile River, they worshipped the God of the Nile, when they worshipped all these different gods, God brought a plague against every one of them to show every one of them that I am greater than your gods. Every single one of them. He brought these plagues up. So the last one was going to be death. Because <laughs> we've been studying Revelation, and there's several times that, it's, that it states in there that it says, Herein is the patience of the saints. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. That, that's the patience of the saints. And we, and you're, and, uh, we studied that, how a lot of these things that the beast, the Antichrist, brought against God's elect is all going to come back on them in the end. Okay? We reap what we sow. Amen? Galatians 6, 7, and 8. God is not mocked, right? A man will sow what, uh, reap what he sows. So, this last event, death was going to come. And God instructed every one of them to, get a, uh, to take a lamb, to sacrifice this lamb, and we're not going to talk a whole lot about that because we're going to do that next, this coming Friday at the Seder meal. And I really hope you guys can make it. So, but we want to start in Exodus chapter 12 today. Okay? And we're going to go through 1 through 6. He gave us this here physical thing to do to teach us that something spiritual was going to come. And the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt saying, This month shall be the beginning of months, okay? So God is starting a brand new year. The new, the year, the, remember the Jews have two calendars. They have a civil year that always starts in the fall. And this is their sacred calendar that's going to start in the spring. Just like you have a civil birthday of when you were literally born. We're going to celebrate Pats here, coming right up. But there's a spiritual side of that. There's a sacred calendar, the day you got born again. So there's one when you got born, and there's one when you got born again. So here's the one, 
where you're born again. This is the month of you shall be the beginning of the months, and it shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak unto the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month. The tenth day. Remember that. They shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. Now remember, when this Passover happens, this was not for strangers. This is a family affair. If you had maidservants, manservants, and they weren't part of your family, they could not partake of this. This is for God's house. Amen? This is God's house. This is God's house. Even communion. When it says, if any man comes in an unworthy manner and eats and drinks, can eat and drink damnation in themselves, this is the reference. Not that they've got sin. God doesn't have a problem with taking care of your sin. He took care of your sin problem. But he has a problem with people that don't think they need him. That's the problem. That they're satisfied with their life or whatever uh, church or religion they're going to and not having a personal relationship with Christ. Okay? This is all about, it. This is all about family. For every house according to their, uh, their father, a lamb for a house. And if the house will be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man according to the eating shall you count for the lamb. And your lamb, your lamb shall be without blemish. A male of the first year, you shall take it from the sheep or from the goats and you shall keep it means to guard it. We guard our treasures, right? We keep it until the 14th day of that same month. And the whole assembly of God of Israel shall kill it in the evening. Okay. So it's going to be killed in the evening, but it's got to be taken on the 10th day. Do you know what the 10th day is of the first month of the year? It's Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday. That's when it is. So everyone would come and get their lamb. And the first thing you would do when you would take this lamb, and you know that this Passover season is coming, that you would come and you would take this lamb, and you would take it to the priest. And if Bonnie was the priest, I would say, here's my lamb. You know, make sure it's okay. So she would look at this, or he would look at this. Sorry about that, Bonnie. And Bonnie would look over this lamb and make sure that it, it, it's okay. Because if I brought something with a broken leg or it's lame, or I'm thinking, man, you know, I'm a sheep herder, and this one here's got a disease, and I want to get rid of it anyhow, I'll just go sacrifice that to God. How would God ever find any honor in that? How would God ever find any? You know, David, when um, um, he took the census, and he didn't take the, the money, you're supposed to always take money for the census. And, and he refused to do it. He said, no, just, just don't take the money. And what he was telling God is that you know, the silver was always the price of redemption. And by not taking the money, it's saying redemption is cheap. It doesn't, cost, doesn't mean nothing. So God smote him, and he came back, and then he had a sacrifice. And, he, and this guy, he said, hey, let me purchase this field. Let me purchase this, this area, and I'm going to sacrifice to the Lord. He said, just take what you want. And he said, I will not sacrifice something that cost me nothing. It doesn't mean anything. It doesn't cost you anything. So you bring the best. You bring the best. God brought the best when he redeemed you. He brought the best. And he expects and he wants the best for you. So I would bring this lamb. And she would, he would, <laughs> look over this lamb. And if it was good, Took a marker, a little metal thing. To, yep, this is John's. And it would hang it around his neck so that we, we would know whose lamb belonged to who. Because you wouldn't want to take uh, a lamb that had Jeannie's name on it and sacrifice it for my family. Right? Because Jeannie needs that. So we all had our own and everyone had its own identification. And, and uh, we'll see that pretty soon that when Jesus is hanging on the cross, that God's got his own name upon that. Jesus of Nazareth. King of the Jews. 
And in Latin, it, it, it said, uh, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. In, in Greek, because it was written in, in Latin, which is what the Romans read, and then Greek for the Greeks in Hebrew. And in Greek, it, 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 Jesus, uh, the letter spelled Z-U-E-S, Zeus. Zeus was the all-supreme God. And they're like, wow, so every time the, the Greeks would go by, they're like, wow, that's Zeus's? That's Zeus's land. That's God's land to the, to the Jews. And to the Romans, they're wow, look, the, he's the king. It said it to him. But in Hebrew, it said Y-H-V-H, Yahweh. It had Yahweh's name on it. That's God's lamb sitting up there. That's God's lambs written up there. That's why the priests and the scribes came along and said, hey, don't write that. Don't write that, Pilate. Write something else, but don't write that. And he said, what I wrote, I wrote. Don't, don't, don't try to change my mind. That was God's lamb. So, so everything was set in its motion. So now we come to the point. I want you to see this first. And we're going to go to Zechariah. Go to Malachi and turn left for those who. Uh... So we're in Zechariah, verse 9, okay? And it says this. Now look, look at how it's going to say this. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Okay? O daughter of Zion. Zion is the heavenly Jerusalem. Okay, shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. So there's a heavenly Jerusalem mentioned, and there's an earthly Jerusalem mentioned. Notice the two. There's two Jerusalems, so something is going to be physical, and something is going to be spiritual. God gives us the physical to teach us of the spiritual. O daughters of Jerusalem, behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just. We're going to find out that Pilate's going to even call him that. And having salvation, lowly riding upon a donkey and upon the colt, the foal of a donkey. Did you notice the two? The earthly Jerusalem and the spiritual Jerusalem. Let's go now to Matthew. Matthew chapter 21. Matthew Chapter 21, this is the triumphal entry. All right. And when they drew nigh unto Jerusalem and were come unto Bethphage. Okay, Bethphage is a town and it literally means the house of figs. So Beth always means house. If you see like Beth L, L is for God, so it would be house of God, is what Beth Elm, Beth Fidge is house of figs, okay? When we seen in the very beginning, Adam and Eve, and they were in the garden, and they sinned, remember that? They sinned in the garden, bam, all of a sudden they realize they're naked. You didn't know that before? What happened? And I believe this is the John Buckland version. I've said this several times that I believe because when you see God, uh, talk about God, the Bible says that God is clothed in light. He's clothed in light. He's clothed in glory. He's clothed in light. And he made man and woman. He made them in their image. So my thought is, if God is clothed in light, wouldn't Adam and Eve be clothed in light? And as soon as they sin, bam, that light's gone. And oh, what happened to me? What happened to me? And they hid themselves. And you know what they did? They sowed fig leaves, the house of figs. They're right there in the Garden of Eden. And God's going to cast them out of the east. 
Just like Jesus is going to walk out of the east side of Jerusalem when he's crucified. And they're going to go right past Bethphage, the place where the figs grew. And he's going to curse a tree, we're going to see, here in just a little bit. He's going to curse a tree. It's going to wither up. It's going to die from roots because God's saying he gave us the physical to teach us the spiritual. And he was saying to his, cre his creature, saying, you don't have to worry about covering yourself with figs no more. I'm going to take care of your sin problem. You don't have to worry about your sin problem no more. You don't have to worry about covering your sin. You don't have to worry about your shame. I'm going to take all that away from you. I'm going to take your sickness, your shame, your griefs, your sorrow, and I'll bear them myself so that you don't have to. Okay? So he comes to this first place of, the, of, the, of this house of figs into the Mount of Olives. And he sent two of his disciples and he said, Go to the village over and against you and straightway you will find a donkey tied. A colt with her. Loose them and bring them to me. And if any man say aught unto you, you shall say, The Lord has need of them. And straightway he will send them. Because Zechariah, the prophet, already said he's coming with the donkey. He's coming on it, right? He's coming. And this was all done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the prophets. Tell the daughters of Zion, Behold, thy king cometh unto thee, meek and sitting upon a donkey, and the colt, the foal of a donkey. And the disciples went, and they did as Jesus commanded them, and they brought the donkey and the colt, and they put on, the, and they put on them their clothes, and set them thereon. And a very great multitude spread their garments in the way. And others cut down branches from the trees and strawed them in the way. You see, this is what people of the day would do to a conquering king. If your king went out to battle and your armies went out to wage war against the enemies that are coming up against you, and they fought and they won a great victory as they're riding back into town. All the town folk would put these palm branches in their clothes and they would hail the king. Hail to the king. He's conquered them. Well, we're safe now. We don't have to worry no more. And they're putting this down and they're yelling, Hosanna, Hosanna. God save us. Why? Because they were in the devil's bondage. They were in the enemy's Egypt. And they needed a rescuer to come. They needed a rescuer to come. And here comes Jesus. And he's riding on this donkey that Zacharias, long before, had talked about. Okay? And the multitude went on before him and followed and cried and said, Hosanna to the son of David. Now, wait a minute. The son of David. Who was the son of David? Solomon. Solomon was the son of David. Now, Jesus is going to come in under that ancestry, right? But Jesus was supposed to be of the tribe of Judah. Not David. David didn't have a tribe. David was of the tribe of Judah, just as Jesus was of Judah and David. But there's a mystery here. There's a mystery here that we have to learn. Because the son of David is Solomon. So what does Solomon have to do with Jesus? I mean, Solomon was, was this wise man, right? He, I mean, he was anointed king. He had all these other brothers that um, um, wanted to be king. The oldest one he met, he was killing the fatted calf. He was killing the oxen. Dad's on his deathbed, so <laughs> I'm next in line. All right. So Bathsheba comes up, and he, she comes to David, and David is in, in bed, and, and, and he's dying. And his body can't even make heat anymore. So they got this young lady who's laying with him just to keep him warm. And there's, there's a whole message in that. And it's not a heat problem anymore. Is the fact is he, he's having a heart problem. He's old, and his heart ain't beating like it should be, so the body becomes cold. 
right? And they're trying to save him as much as they can. So we're going to throw on the heat and, and <coughs> excuse me, they're going to bring this young lady in to try to warm him up and, and to keep him warm. And Bathsheba comes up and says, didn't you say, didn't you say that your son Solomon would sit on your throne after you're gone? Didn't you say that, Dave? Didn't you? And uh, he said, because your oldest son is killing the fatted calf and he's killing the oxen and he's making himself king. And as soon as he's king, he's going to kill me and he's going to kill Solomon. And David said, bring me the priests. Bring me the priests. So David brought in the priests before him. And, and David said, I want to anoint Solomon. I'm going to anoint Solomon. Now, I'm going to go to 1 Kings. 1 Kings talks all about this. 1 Kings, maybe I got this wrong. That might be 2 Kings. <coughs> no, 1 Kings. So David is dying. David is dying. And, huh? We're going to be in chapter 1. Uh, we're going to be in chapter 1. 1 Kings chapter 1. And um, so they wanted to, they wanted to, uh, Adon, Adonijah, that was his oldest brother. He was killing all the flat fatted calf. And, um, and, and David said, no, bring me the priest. So verse 10 said, But Nathan the prophet and Benaniah and the mighty man and Solomon, his brother, were not called. They weren't called to uh, his older brother who was um, anointing himself to be king. Therefore Nathan spoke unto Bathsheba, the mother of Solomon, saying, Hast thou not heard that Adon Adonijah, <laughs> well, how are you able to say that, son of David doth reign, and David our Lord knoweth it not? Therefore come, let me, I pray thee, give you counsel that you may save your own life and the life of your son Solomon. Go and get thee to King David, and say unto him, Did not thou, my lord, king, swear unto thine handmaiden, saying, Surely Solomon, my son, shall reign after me, and you will sit upon my throne? Why does Adonai, whatever, reign? And behold, why yet talkest with the king? I will come in after and confirm the words. So Bathsheba does all that, and, and uh, I want to move on with this. And um, um, verse 22, and, and lo, while she yet talked with the king, Nathan the prophet came in. And the king said, saying, Behold, Nathan the prophet. And when he was come in before the king, he bowed himself before the king with his face to the ground. And Nathan said, My lord king, hast thou said, and what is <laughs> Adonai, Adonai, whatever, shall reign after me and sit on the throne. For he has gone down this day and has slain the oxen and the fat of sheep and with the abundance and hath called all the king's sons and the captain of the host and Abinard the priest. And behold, they eat and drink before him, saying, God save the king, Adet, whatever his name is. But me, <laughs> even me, thy servant, Zadok the priest, Benaniah the son of Jehoiakim, the servant of Solomon, has said, called me not, has not called. And this is the thing done by my lord the king, and has not showed unto thy servant who should sit in the throne before the king after him. Then David answered and said, call me Bathsheba. And she came unto the king's presence and stood before the king. And the king swore and said, as the Lord liveth, that hath redeemed my soul out of all distress. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Even as I swear unto thee by the Lord God of Israel, saying, Assuredly, Solomon, thy son, shall reign after me, and he shall sit upon my throne in my stead. Even so will I certainly do this day. Then Bathsheba bowed down her face unto the earth, and did reverence to the king, and said, Let my lord King David live forever. And the king David said, Call me Zadok the priest, Nathan the prophet, Benaniah the son of Jehoiadani. And they came before the king, and the king said, 
take with you the servants of our Lord and call Solomon, my son, to ride upon my own mule. See, David had a mule that was special to him. It was called the king's mule. And every time there was a celebration, and every time that there was a special event, David rode upon his mule. So when we see Jesus riding upon the mule, this isn't just any mule, this is the king's mule. You see, he came in once riding the mule, but the next time he comes in, <laughs> he's riding a white horse, yeah, and he's, <laughs> he's going to come with the, the powers of heaven, the glory behind him with all the saints, and he's going to ride in on a new horse that's going to be the king's horse, and upon his legs is going to have a, a name written that no one else knows, and on the other leg is going to say, King of kings and Lord of lords, Amen. Amen, hallelujah. So this picture that Matthew is painting here is a picture of Solomon. Did you know that Solomon built the house of God? Up to this time, there was none. There was this tabernacle. We just got done studying about the tabernacle. It had all the skins and it had this tent that would tear down and when God would move and they would see the glory of God move, they'd tear everything down and start following the leading of God. Well, now Solomon comes along, and David's, David's idea, David wanted to build the house, and God told him, no, there's blood on your hands, but your son Solomon will do it. So Solomon built a house of worship. Solomon built an earthly, that's why it said, rejoice, daughter of Jerusalem, because one of the kings is going to build an earthly home. And there's going to be another one that's going to come that's going to build the heavenly home. Amen? The heavenly Jerusalem. Rejoice, oh you daughters of Jerusalem. Rejoice. And that's what he's saying of Zion. God made, Solomon might build a temporary home that eventually someone's going to destroy. But God's building one that no one's ever going to destroy. Amen? No one's ever going to destroy. <coughs> Excuse me. You know, we grieve when we have a loss in our life. And that young lady, 30 years old, and it sure is a tragedy. But I'm telling you what, you know, she closed her earthly eyes once. And when she opened her heavenly eyes and saw that glorious home of God, whoo! Oh, man, you'll never go back. Amen? So Solomon is riding this, this mule. Now let's go back to. Let's go back to Matthew. Oh, man, my time flies by. And a very great multitude spread their garments. I'm in Matthew chapter 21, verse 8. And a very great multitude spread their garments on the way because a conquering king is coming to town. They cut down branches of the trees and they straw them in the ways. And the multitudes went on before them that followed them and cried, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. Uh, Hosanna in the highest. And when he was come to Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? And the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet of, the Nazar of Nazareth of Galilee. And Jesus went in to the temple. And Jesus went in to the temple. You see, this is the day, the tenth, the tenth of Nisan. This is the tenth when everybody brought their lambs to the priest. And that, that lamb had to be examined. It had to be examined. There's, that's why Jesus rode in this spotless, sinless son of God and stood before the priests. Now you read the rest of chapter 21 and you read the rest of chapter 2. You're going to see everyone's a questioning his authority. The, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, everyone is questioning him. And when you get to chapter, or the end of the chapter, in verse 42, this is chapter 22, verse 42, and they say, what do you think of Christ? Whose son is he? Now this is Jesus asking them. 
And they said, the son of David. And they said unto him, well, then how's come David in the spirit called him Lord, saying, the Lord said to my Lord, sit thou on my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. If David called him Lord, then how is he son? Look at verse 46. And no man was able to answer him a word, neither durst any man from that day forth ask him any more questions. See, there was nothing, there was nothing, no guilt found in him. He didn't answer a wrong question. They couldn't even come up with anything to accuse him of. He was perfect and he was just riding on the foal of a donkey. Amen? Isn't that an awesome picture? So this is what's so great about this day. Now I'm going to go back to chapter uh, tw uh, 12 and i got to hurry up here because I'm running short of time. And Jesus, well, thank you, Cindy. <laughs> and Jesus went into the temple of God, and he cast out them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves. See, the money changers were, were people that were, they were working in, in, the, in the temple. They were working in there. And the money changer was, if Bonnie came from Egypt, and now she came to Israel, she had to use Israeli money. So there was an exchange. When I was in the military, uh, they wanted me to go to the Philippines to bring back an aircraft that was down. And the exchange rate in the Philippine Islands at that time was 77 to 1. So for every $1 I gave them, they gave me back 77 Filipino dollars. Okay? That's the exchange rate. That's what money changers do. So... I might say, hey, Bonnie, the exchange rate's 77 to 1, but really it's 100 to 1. She don't know that. She's not from this area. So I give her $77, but really I'm keeping 23 of those dollars back for mine. I'm ripping her off. And that's going on in the temple of God. It's going on in the temple of God. So Jesus comes in there, and he's going to cleanse the house. Jesus always cleans the house before he comes. We're supposed to clean the house before we comes, but Jesus came in to clean the house. You read Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3, you know what he's doing? He's cleaning the house. He's cleaning the house. You know why? Because chapter 4, he's coming. He's coming for his bride. He's not coming for a dirty one. He's coming for a clean one. He's always cleaning the house. You know, I said last week, and it's very important to understand, God took away the guilt of sin. It's up to us to remove the presence of it. It's up to us to remove the presence of it. God took care of the guilt. We take care of the presence. God cleaned the house. Amen? All right, now I'm going to skip over here because I'm running out of time. Verse 18. Uh, let's go to verse 17. And he left, verse 17, now I want to make this real point, and it says, he left them and went out into the city of Bethany. The word Bethany means house of poverty. It means house of poverty. Now he was just in the house of the figs, which figs is a, is a, a, a sign of sin. And this is the point I want to make. When you're living in a house of sin, you better know that the next house you live in is going to be the house of poverty. Because it's the only thing that sin can do. It'll rob you of everything you got. You leave a, a house of sin, you're going to have a broken home. I mean, broke financially, broke everything. You're going to be a house of poverty, okay? And in the morning, he returned to the city, and he hungered. And when he saw the fig tree in the way, he came to it and found nothing on it. You know why? Because this is the spring. This is Passover is always in the spring. Fig harvest is in the fall. And he's just coming out of winter. There ain't no leaves on the trees. There ain't nothing there yet. He didn't have a, season, a time yet to grow. And when he saw the fig tree in the way, he came to it and found nothing on it, but leaves only, and said, let no fruit grow on thee henceforth evermore. And presently the tree withered away. And when the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, how soon is this fig tree withered away? And Jesus said unto you, verily I say unto you, if you have faith and, and doubt not, you shall not only do this, which is done to the fig tree, but also if you say to this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast in the sea, it shall be done. All things 
and all things, and all things. Let me see if I'm reading this right. And all things whatsoever you ask in prayer, believing you shall receive. Isn't that awesome? Cindy, your, your ankles are healed in Jesus' name. Bonnie, your side is healed in Jesus' name. Um, Frogman is being strengthened in, in the way right now. Marvin is healed. Tom's going to be sitting next to you, Jeannie. I'm telling you, and all your sons are going to be sitting right beside you, and they're all going to be shouting hallelujah. One of these days, I'm telling you, God is not slack concerning his promises. He is not slack concerning his promises, but he will say, do everything that he said he's going to do. That fig tree was an emblem of sin. We don't have to cover ourselves no more. The blood of the lamb is going to do it himself. Amen? Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Give the Lord a shout in the house. Amen? Yeah. Woo! Everybody get fed today? Yeah. Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus, King of kings and Lord of lords. Oh, you're so good. Woo! Father God, I pray that as we leave this place, that you light a fire under every one of them. The Holy Ghost come down. Fill the house. Fill the house with your presence, oh Lord God. I pray in Jesus' name that we're blabbermouths for Jesus, that we're blessed when we go in and we're blessed when we come back out. We're the head and not the tail because you lead us, you guide us, you protect us. Father God, as we leave here, let us be about our Father's business. Till you return again on that white horse, leading the heavenly host with him. Father, we give you all the thank, thanks and praise that is due. In Jesus' name, amen.